Welcome back, scholars, to Making Meaning, while we practice wondering with nonfiction. I'm Miss Keller, and I'm so happy to be back with you again today. In our lesson today, like our last lesson, you will need a talk partner. You may choose to speak to a family member in your home language. I just want you to practice conversing and sharing your thinking in a clear way to show your understanding. In our last lesson, we were reading Insect Detective by Steve Volk, illustrated by Charlotte Volk, and published by Candlewick Press. We read the first part of this text, and we practiced asking questions and seeing what we learned from the text. Today, we're gonna to do something similar while we finish the rest of the text, the text and look for answers to the questions we asked previously. As a refresher for your brains, in this text, it talked about how there are over 200 million insects in the world. We learned about wasps being social insects. They work together to build their nests, which is made of a wood pulp. Another social insect we talked about were ants. We talked about how they use their antenna to communicate. Then we talked about solitary insects, or insects that live by themselves. We learned that the bee is a solitary insect that collects nectar from the spring flowers, and they live in cavities, which are holes in the walls, in the ground. Oh, we learned about leaf miner caterpillars that live between the leaves. See those squiggly lines right there? We also learned about earwigs, which look scary because of their pinchers, but are not. Because they use those to help them with their babies, their eggs, when they clean them. Today, we're going to read the rest of this text and we're going to be using the following sentence stems. We have, I wonder. So whenever we're asking questions, you can say, I wonder, blank. We have, what. Another question word you might use is, why, or when, or who, or where, or how. And then while we're reading, we get answers and we use, I learned, blank. I'm gonna leave these up here to remind you. All right, scholars, let's continue our text. Of course, you might find some creatures under there that aren't insects. That means are not insects. Spiders, wood lice, Centipedes and slugs are not insects. And once I found a baby frog. It's easy to tell something is not an insect. All you have to do is count the legs. If it has six, one, two, three, four, five, six, it is an insect. If it doesn't have six legs, it isn't. What did we learn about insects from this part of the book? We're going to stop and think. All right, scholars, using I learned Turn to your partner. Wow, I heard some of you talking about how we know if it's an insect or not, whether it has six legs. And spiders, wood lice, centipedes, and slugs do not have six legs. 
so they are not insects. If you're lucky, you might even find a colored ground beetle gleaming in the sunlight. It's like discovering a precious jewel. But ground beetles aren't just pretty to look at. They're excellent hunters too. At night they go out hunting for slugs and snails, which makes gardeners very happy. What did we just learn about the ground beetle? Stop and think. And when you're ready, turn to your partner. That's right, ground beetles gleam in the sunlight. So that means they're really shiny and they're great hunters. Gardeners like them because they get snails and slugs which eat our gardens. Perhaps the greatest hunter of all is the dragonfly. Even the name sounds fierce. But don't worry, they won't come chasing after you. Dragonflies are much more interested in catching things like flies, mosquitoes, and gnats. Some will even snatch a spider from its web. On summer days when the air is still, you can see their wings sparkling in the light as they hunt, twisting, diving, and plucking flies from the air. Ooh, we have a couple captions on this page. Dragonflies are fabulous flyers. They have two sets of powerful wings, which they can use to hover. When something hovers, that means it can stay in one place in the air without moving in any direction. So it just moves its wings and it stays in one spot. So they have two sets of powerful wings. One, two. They, which they can use to hover, change direction, and even fly backwards. What reasons does the author give to support the idea that dragonflies are fabulous flyers? And when you're ready, Isn't it cool that they can hover in one spot? And another thing that we learned was that they can fly backwards. That makes them fabulous flyers. A little bit more about dragonflies. It's hard to believe they started their life in the water. Can you spot the dragonfly on top of the water? Dragonflies lay their eggs in ponds or slow moving rivers where they hatch out into small dragonfly nymphs. A nymph sheds its skin many times until it is fully grown. Finally, it climbs out of the water and rests on the stem of a plant. As the dawn breaks, its skin splits open and a beautiful dragonfly comes out, unfolding its wings and drying itself in the sun. Nymphs are dragonfly young. They don't have wings like adult dragonflies. The special changes that take place in insects' bodies are called metamorphoses. They happen in different ways as insects grow from egg to adult. Sometimes when you think about these strange and wonderful things, moths hiding, ants talking, dragonflies changing, it's hard to believe that they could really be true. But you don't have to take my word for it. All you have to do is step 
outside. Wow, scholars. I'm now going to have us really hone in. That means we're going to focus on our questions and answers about the insects in this book. I want you to think, what is one important thing that you learned about insects from this book? When you are ready, you may turn to your partner. I just had a phone in from one of my scholars. They said that they learned that dragonflies lay their eggs in ponds and the baby dragonflies without wings are called nymphs. Someone else really liked learning about the beetles and how they gleam in the sunlight. Do you remember this chart from yesterday? These were some of the questions that we had about our wonders. I'm wondering if any of these were answered in our text. Yesterday we talked about, I'm going to put a mark on it, a star next to it. We did start getting an answer to that from the text. It says, I wonder how many insects are in the world. We learned that there are over 200 million. What do insects eat? That one was answered in the text too. If I go back to my text, I can, in the beetles, it says here, they're great for gardeners because they hunt for slugs and snails. That means that they eat slugs or snails. We love them. So we did learn a little bit about that question in our text. I'm going to put a star by that one, too. I wonder if leaf miner caterpillars ever come out of the leaves again after they eat, get inside them. This text, whoops, did not answer that question. And that's okay. Sometimes our questions are not answered in the text. We have other ways that we can learn the answers to those questions. We could go with an adult onto the internet and type that question in. We could watch a TV show about leaf miner caterpillars. There's many different ways that we can get answers to that. What types of insects swim? Well, we know that dragonflies, we kind of got that answer, live they begin their life in a pond. So we started to get that. I'll put a star next to that. Just like we can go and research our question here. I'm wondering now, what other questions do you have still from this book that we might need to go look somewhere else to get answers to. Stop and think. And when you're ready, go ahead, using our wonder stems, tell your partner what you're still wondering. I had a great question that came up still. What other insects lay eggs in the water? Hmm, we know that dragonflies do. That's why we kind of said that they swim. That kind of answered that question. But if we're wondering more, maybe that's a great question to go with an adult to check out online. The great thing about asking questions with nonfiction topics is that it really gets our brains turned on 
makes us into researchers. It's okay to still have questions and go look up the answers, scholars. We might find more answers in other texts as well, which we'll be reading together in the next couple weeks. Before we can move on, I'd like to go on to a couple words that we learned today. We have two new words. Our first one is regularly. Say regularly. Let's clap it out. Regularly. Oh, that's so many syllables. I love it. Okay. In our text, we regularly, it says here, the earwigs regularly wash their eggs. That means that they do it often, like every day. We brush our teeth regularly. We're supposed to brush our teeth twice a day. In the morning and at night is when I brush my teeth regularly. I'm wondering what other things that you do regularly. How often do you do it? Do you do it every day? More than one time a day? I heard someone say that they regularly go outside and get some exercise right now. Every day they're doing it, at least for 90 minutes, because it's important to keep our bodies moving so we can stay healthy. That's something we do regularly. I want you to keep thinking about what you might do regularly over the next couple of days. And I'll check in with you again at our next lesson. We have another word today, and it is gleam. Say gleam. We heard this word when we were talking about the beetles. You may have heard me say already that gleam means to shine very shiny. You can see how the artist drew that, has that little spot where the sunlight is hitting it to show that it's shiny or gleaming. In this picture, the window washer is cleaning off the windows and it's so shiny that they can see their reflection. It gleams, the window gleams. I'm wondering, what is something else that gleams? I know in my kitchen that I have some utensils like spoons and forks that when they're clean, they gleam. I can see my reflection in them. What other objects in your kitchen gleam? I challenge you to go in there today and see which items have light shining off of them. Which ones can you see your reflection in? That means they are that's right, gleaming. All right, scholars, before I send you on your own, I want to remind you of what you need to do to be a strong reader independently. You're going to get a nonfiction text, and you are going to preview it before you read it to make sure that it's interesting to you. And think about what it might be about, asking that questions before you read, and then read a couple pages and continue wondering. So when I preview my book, I look at the cover, I like the photograph on the front. It gives me an idea of what this book might be about, a raccoon. And then on the back, it gives me some information about this text. Who needs to visit a safari park when you can find wildlife right on your doorstep? This book examines city raccoons and discusses where they live, what they eat, what dangers they face, and why they like living so close to people. So I think this book might be about raccoons living in the city. The table of contents is a text feature that could help me think about that even further. One chapter is going to be about who has been caught stealing from a dumpster. 
that starts on page four. Or why do raccoons live in towns and cities? Page six. So I think my prediction might be pretty accurate about this is going to be about raccoons living in the city. And I'm going to actually go to that page six. It's nonfiction. I don't have to read this text in order because I want to hear about them living in the city. This is why do raccoons live in the towns and cities? Most raccoons live in the country. They find shelter, food, and water in woodlands. Woodlands are parks or forests, which we talked about in our last lesson. Raccoons are smart and easily learn how to live in new places. Human houses and backyards are full of things to eat and places to hide. I can see that the photograph is showing me that they're eating garbage. So they have lots of food there. And I'm going to pause when I'm done reading, and I'm going to write about my reading. I wrote, this book is raccoon. I put the title of my book. I said, I think this book is about how raccoons survive living near cities. After I made that prediction, I had a couple wonders. So I wanted to write those down to remind myself. I wonder how raccoons came to live in cities. And I also wonder how raccoons survive in the city. All right, scholars, go ahead, go get your nonfiction book and enjoy reading today.